Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're having a first look at the horse Caitlin, who belongs to Victoria here. Now, Victoria is someone, uh, they're from Belarus. They actually came to visit us in New York um, a couple of years back and watched one of the clinics. It was the first person that I had met from Russia, so wonderful, and we've been going there, as a, you all know, last year, and we'll be going there again this year. So hopefully she will we'll be able to get her horse to the clinic at that time. Now, this horse is only two years old when they're starting this, and one of her questions is, well, you know, people tell me that I shouldn't be working a horse this young. Well, they have nowhere there to turn the horse out. The horses don't have pastures they can live in year-round and that sort of thing. So they have to kind of be stalled. So the answer to that is yes. Then you want to start doing this work, but doing it in a sensible manner, just as you are doing, keeping the horse calm, doing most of the work in the walk. But, of course, that's what we have to replace is that idea that the horses, when they're outside all the time, are constantly moving with their heads down. But when we have nowhere to keep them outside, where they are moving on grass, where they move continuously, we have to kind of replace that a little bit by doing the work. And doing the work sensibly. That is not just putting them on the end of the lunge line and running them like lunatics for an hour at a time, which would not be the case at all, and we'd end up uh, with a sore horse. But what you're doing here is exactly what you want to do. And really what we have to do often here in California, I'm about to start a two-year-old myself for a friend of mine, um, because we don't have pastures here. I mean, even if you, even the people who can afford pastures, sometimes they don't allow us to use the water to water them. So we're in the same situation as you are there, only because we don't have enough water and we live in a, in a, in a desert, basically. So we have that same problem. But what I'm seeing here is really good work. I think you're right on track with what you're trying to do. And she looks wonderful. I really look forward to seeing you next year. So you've done a really good job up to this point. Really not seeing a problem here at all with anything. You're doing a great job of getting her, getting your contact back. It's always difficult getting that feeling of keeping the whip in the right place, just like when we ride. That's the hardest thing about working hand is to uh, keep the whip where we want it, just like when you ride. And if your leg isn't where it needs to be and it's up on the horse's shoulder or it's too far back, or the case may be, or not down far enough, which is often the case of somebody who too, is too small riding a very big horse, you're never going to be able to get much done. So that's why we try to keep the horse, the whip rather, right exactly where your leg would be. And you're doing a good job of, of all of this. Once in a while, it looks like right there, you see the whip is rather up in the air. And when you get to that point, then you want to keep reminding yourself to put it back down. So the whip is always exactly where your leg would be. So you can use it instantaneously. Um, that can be a difficult uh, thing to do as we first begin to learn how to do this. And even for me, when you see me do it, sometimes I will lose the position of the whip. But, it, but of course, I put it right back down where it is. So I keep reminding myself to get back to where I need to be. Once again, so that we can respond instantly to what the horse is doing. So really, for a young horse of this age, and she looks quite mature. So this is going to turn into a very nice horse from what I see here. But all this work in hand, remember, you can never go wrong, you know, hardly with walking because horses at any age and whatever can, can do a lot of walking, whether they're too old to do much or they're too young to do much or they're too debilitated to do much. But uh, just about at any stage, we can do quite a bit of walk. And that beauty, being the beauty of the walk, Mr. Oliver used to always say the walk is where we explain everything to the horse and uh, I would add to that that that's also where the rider gets the opportunity to develop their skills without everything coming at them so fast that they uh, you know, just kind of end up in a quandary, if you will, about what they're supposed to do. So by taking the walk work, we really get a time, our chance to uh, get the horse listening to the aids correctly, learning how to stretch into the contact, everything the rider needs to know as well, but in a slow pace that nothing is going to get too bad. So this is a two-year-old. Once again, a tractor just came by there, um, she explained to me. So, of course, the horse gets a little reactive, and you're doing just the right thing. You just put them right back to work again. That's all you do. I mean, young horses are going to have these moments, but they will have less and less of those moments the more they get consistently in the contact, and the more consistently uh, we ask them to be there. <coughs> Excuse me, everyone. Just got back from Australia a few days we had ago. We had a wonderful trip there. I was a little sick in between the clinics, unfortunately, so I'm still coughing that a little bit. So great work in your work in hand there. I see no problem with that. And once again, you did just the right thing when she acted out a little bit. You just start again. You act like nothing happened. Just come right back to work. You don't overreact. 
Of course, the more you over, would overreact, the more the horse would overreact. So you handle that in exactly the way I would want you to do that. So starting out on the lunge here, what I do think it's time for, having watched this um, through here, is that she does get a little anxious or, and shakes her head a little bit, that sort of thing. So I think this horse is ready to begin work in side reins, is what I would say about all that, is that uh, now she's ready to begin to stretch into the contact and learn to take that consistent contact. Um, and, that, that, and also that that's not going to hurt her. And of course, that's what we want to have happen. Now, you've already done a pretty good job of the horse working in hand, and she was handling the contact with your hands uh, very nicely. So um, in my opinion, that's what you want to do next. And of course, that in, to some degree, you know, when we start the trot work on this horse, she's rather high, as you said. And of course, she has all that energy she wants to explode a little bit, and you're doing a good job of containing it. And that's kind of what she does is, you know, the shaking the head a little bit like that. That's just a little bit of the horse feeling good and wanting to express itself. But, but in here, it's, you know, she isn't blowing up too bad. She gets a little worse when we go to the trot. It's kind of funny with our horse, perhaps, that Barb Bolton now has because she was literally one of the craziest, you know, horses that I've ever worked with. It took years to calm her down. And now she is, but what you'll see when she is having a little a day like that where she has a lot of energy where years ago she would have been leaping into the air, she will shake her head a little bit like that. And then that's about the extent of what she does. So, you know, um, we don't complain too much about that compared to what she used to do. So we always are making compromises when we're training horses. You know, they're not just going to come out on any given day and be perfect. But what we do have to not compromise is, is our own sort of mental attitude while we're doing all this work. You know, in other words, that just like you did in your work in hand, where she blew up a little bit, oh, and you just you didn't make a big deal of it. You just went right on doing what you were doing, and that's exactly what you want to do. So I'm seeing a good active walk here most of the time, and you see she has, you know, like most young horses, it takes years for horses to settle in. It always takes about two years to settle a horse into the aids, if you will. Um, in that, that even is when it's done by the best riders in the world, you know, so it takes time. So I think what I'm seeing here is very good. With a young horse, one of the first things that we just do, not worrying about what they're doing, but just to keep them just in a walk, just so that they're not exploding out of the walk, just to get that discipline that they'll stay in the walk. This will go a long way when you get on for the first time. Right there's a really nice stretch, and you can see how you know, it's always fascinating to see when they go down, when she gets a little deeper, and you see the horse really stretch the whole neck all the way to the top of the withers. You see how much more action there is in the hocks, that the horse hocks start taking, like right there. See how the step gets bigger as she goes down. That's what we want to see, that optimal movement. But optimal movement is not too fast. Remember, the biggest mistake I see all the time is people mistaking the word forward for run. You know, we see trainers all the time saying, go forward, go forward, and they have them running out of speed. Um, out of out of speed and out of rhythm. So what happens is every horse in the world, if you go past a certain speed, the the inertia that is the mass of the horse will start to drive itself onto the forehand. The horse isn't strong enough to deal with it, so it will actually start pushing it onto the forehand because the weight of the horse is coming forward like a freight train. It takes a while for that freight train to stop. Well, the same thing is true of horses when they get too fast. So learning to recognize the optimal speed is the most important skill as you go. That, and once again, that optimal speed um, means the horse is working over its back in that optimal speed. So if we go too slow, the back won't develop. If we go too fast, it won't develop because the horse will just run on its forehand. So we're always looking for that perfect spot where the horse is engaging to the degree that it can up to, up to the back, but it's not so fast that it's beginning to run downhill onto its forehand. And once again, we can't expect them to just be perfect. At this age, they're not going to be. And if it takes you, whatever, 15, 20 minutes to settle them down at this age, well, that's about what I would expect. I don't expect a horse at two years old to come out and just, you know, and work like some horse that's been in training for 10 years. There's, there's going to be more distractions. They're going to overreact when, when they hear noise, things like this. And that's why it's so important that we just act like nothing is a big deal. You know, now she's telling me that in the early stages of this, this horse was dragging her all over the place and leaping in the air and, and all these kinds of things. So you've come a long, long way. And how important that is, because this is, the horse is a little on the young side for all of this um, in terms of what we might ultimately want. But once again, you have to replace that correct work if the horse isn't working itself in the correct way. You know, I was very uh, lucky to grow up in Kentucky where we could 
basically uh, pasture horses without it either being too hot or too cold uh, the entire year round. Um, it would be normal to have just a little bit of snow once or twice a year and then maybe once every five years they get a good two foot drop of snow in that area but it's usually gone within a few days so we're able to keep our horses out all the time you know on good grass and that makes a big big difference. But if we don't have that to raise horses on, it becomes very important that we get them exercised correctly. It doesn't matter whether you have uh, 30 acres, 5 acres, or 100 acres. If it's nothing but dirt, the horses are going to stand around wherever the feed is brought to them. If there's a feed tub or those round hay bales or whatever, that's where they're going to stand all day. Now, it probably would waste a, you know, a certain degree of hay to do this, but... You know, if it were me and I was keeping horses and those kind of things, I would go out and spread the hay all over the field and let them go look for it. You know, as long as it's not raining every day, it would probably be just fine for a while. You know, just spread the amount that they need to eat that particular day or week or whatever the case may be. Three or four days you might be able to do it. So they're out walking around and not all just standing around the feed trough all day waiting for the next feed trough to come. Because it's not that horses go out. You know, I grew up on a horse farm with many, many, many horses, you know, and mares and foals and all of the above. And, you know, and about once every few days, if mares and foals have um, the right amount of space to do it in, you'll see the mares will go out and exercise their babies. And they actually run them around. They keep them under control. It's really quite fascinating to watch. But unfortunately, many people do not have the, that ability. And that's very different. You know, watching mares with their own babies is very different than a bunch of babies together who very often end up damaging each other because... You know, there's there's so no parent involved, if you will, like it is when the, when it's actually the mother who out there watching over what they're doing. And and they know they don't want them to run like lunatics. You know, it's pretty fascinating to watch if you get that opportunity sometime to see horses that are actually raised out, you know, in good quality pastures where the footing is good enough for horses to move correctly. Yeah, so what we're seeing here is just that thing. I mean, she's a little bit... She's on the muscle a little bit, if you will. She feels good. She wants to shake it out. So that's all just very normal. But also why at this point I think this horse is ready to start working in some long side reins because that will begin to settle that down as well. She'll start settling into the bridle more quickly. And that is also part of, uh, of this training. It's, you know, yes, you can lunge horses without anything on them at, at all, but you may find when, if you've never taken any contact you know, with the bridle that you know, they may not understand what you're doing when you get up on their back. So that's why important the importance of the side rein work is to get the horse used to the idea of stretching into something, not just stretching its, its neck down on its own. Now, once we have established that the horse will stretch into the contact, it's, per, it's perfectly fine to not use the side reins on days when the horse comes out there and just stretches beautifully and gets into a beautiful trot as we're developing. That's perfectly fine, but you still would want to alternate that work into side reins at times. Long side reins I'm talking about. I'm not talking about bringing them up, you know, and trying to force them into a phony frame with them. And that, and it's also very important that when you get past that particular point that, you know, if you haven't seen my videos on bringing them up from the stretch of learning to use the side reins in a higher position so the horse will take contact like it's taking contact with reins. And when, ready, when they are ready to do that, they will do that quite easily. But first you start, you know, you just put the side reins on in that middle position, about halfway down, right about the break of the side of the horse, which starts to curve back in again. It's usually about the right place. And about the right length is just so we're never trying to force them in anything. But we don't, when they stretch all the way down, we want them to stretch into contact. So in other words, when the horse is in the position it is, for instance, right there, we'd want that to be the length of the rein. So they stretch down all the way into that contact. But if we leave them too loose, then they can still throw their heads around too much. And if we do it too tight, then we constrict the movement. So it's learning to have an eye for doing both of those things. But this is very good, and I like how you handle it here when she got a little anxious there. And you just brought her back to the walk, and that's actually what you want to do. And you can see what, a con you know, just this developing this idea of slow control. You know, many people today spend very little time walking horses. They think you need to get right into trotting and right into cantering, you know, in every day they work, because that's really what they want to do. But as trainers, and if, and if you are a rider, as far as I'm concerned, you are a trainer. You're training the horse every time you get on it to do something, or you're untraining it, you know, in the case of uh, a bad rider. So, or even doing worse and trying to force them and, and creating real problems at the end of the long side. But 
So that's the basic idea. So we want to teach them all these skills. You see right there, she kind of just decided to take off in the other direction. So he did a good job of handling that, bringing her back. As you said, these young young babies, people who've never never worked babies, and especially you know they who don't have a confined space, you know you, you really learn how to do this because they'll drag you around. I grew up, uh, we didn't have riding rings; we just had big fields. We worked horses, and all the hunt people that I worked with in the early part of my career, they didn't believe in having riding arenas on their farms, you know, because these were hunt horses, and you had to go work them in the fields and uh, you know and do the best you could, and we did, but. Uh, I mean, once again, it can be difficult when you're, you know, very uh, starting some, you know, three and a half year old and it's 18 hands high and it's hardly ever done anything in its life other than just be led into a barn or something. You know, they can decide to uh, drag you around a little bit. So you've done a very good job of bringing it to this point. And what I see here in just that little head shaking is just the horse hasn't settled into that contact yet. It gets right there. Now look how round those hocks get. That's where we want it right now. <clears throat> and once we get that, and then we get that consistent, then we slowly start to bring that up. That is, as long as we can maintain the back. That's what the whole system is based on. <clears throat> Letting the horse develop into what we want, instead of trying to make it, if you will, be what we want by trying to force something or other. Everything that we force always has a bad result in the end, even if that result is uh, just lameness, you know. But many of them become unrideable. A certain amount of horses with a kind of trainer who, you know, who love to browbeat horses, you know, into control and think it's all about, you know, you must do this right now. You know, some of those riders get away with a certain amount, but that gets back to that same thing like with jumping horses. You know, if we train a horse that if it doesn't jump, I'm going to beat you up. One day it will jump a big fence that it shouldn't jump and it will land in the middle over and flip over on top of you. And once again, that's what killed is killing so many riders around the world is these um, rotational falls. And rotational falls can be, can be created by doing nothing but holding the reins too tight in your hands at a walk. They'll fall down as we've seen um, some young trainers happen to uh, in the last few years. If you don't let go of the, of the horse, it will fall on you. And in worst cases, it will fall over on you. That is, it will just flip over. And we've seen them do that at the walk. I've seen a horse cross its legs over and do a complete somersault on top of somebody just at a walk. So once again, as soon as you feel a horse trip, the first thing my father taught me was as soon as I feel a horse trip, I let go of the reins, just slip the reins. It's one of the most important um, tools you will ever learn to keep yourself safe. If you just stay there and stay quiet, the horse will usually... You know, and let go of its head and neck so it can move. And that's, once again, that's the danger of uh, standing martingales and things like this. And if you don't know this, the reason standing martingales were outlawed in international jumping competition because so many people got killed before they did. Because if the horses couldn't get their heads up, they fell over and flipped on people. And that's the worst thing you ever want to have happen to you. So getting back to you here, this is looking really good just as you're settling down. The more it settles, the better it is. And just what you're doing. She tries to go into a canter. You know, just the fact of not letting the horse canter goes to a, a long way to training the horse's mind. Just begin to, with the idea of being under control. You know, some horses, maybe the first time we lunge them, they're too excited to want to trot very much and or to walk, and they want to get all this energy out. <clears throat> so if we can't get them to not, not trot, we can at least get them to not canter, if you will. And just getting them pretty soon, then we'll be able to keep them in the walk, as you've done beautifully with this one. So I don't see a single problem here in terms of what's happening. In fact, I really look forward to seeing you. Hope you're able to make it to the clinic there in Moscow. Well, actually, I'm, I'm hoping I'm still able to get there, you know, that we see what's going on with our politicians all playing games with one another. And whoever knows where any of that might end. If only politicians would grow up. <laughs> The world would be a much better place. So we can see here now she gets a little fast, and that's where you know, I see you working with that. She gets too, too fast, then you just bring them into a small circle. Like you're doing there, just bring her in a little bit. And that's just very normal with young horses to, you know, to want to, they're kind of bursting at the seams, especially, I mean, you live someplace where it's very cold and the horse has probably been in a box and you come in and it, it wants to go leaping around, which is what they will do. I mean, that's the danger of keeping horses boxed, you know, is the fact that they learn, they get all this energy from being in the box. And if they don't, if they're not trained where they learn to contain themselves, then they injure themselves. 
I mean, I can't tell you how many horses I've seen. You know, we see the kind of people who lunge or turn out before they ride in order to wear their horses down enough to be able to ride them. Well, that's probably the biggest mistake you could ever make because A, you're wearing your horse out every day. And every time you do that, it's going to take longer. I mean, we see the people now on these on the jumper circuit and they're like the Florida circuit down in Florida. And the, those of you who know that, who've been there, know that what I'm saying is the truth. Three, four, three, four o'clock in the morning, they start lunging horses. Some of them are lunged for three and a half, four hours before anybody rides them because, quite frankly, they can't get away with drugging them the way they used to. I mean, my own feeling is the horses were probably better off being drugged than what's happening to them now with their lunge for four hours a day. I mean, you're going to kill the horse's legs if you do that. So we want to avoid any kind of running like a lunatic on a lunge line. That's not what lunging is here for. You have to get out of the mentality that we're wearing the horse down. You know, each time you lunge, I mean, a correct lunging uh, should take you about 20 minutes. That's about it, max. If it's taking more than that, and if it takes more than that on a daily basis, you're going to end up with a very, very uh, fit horse <clears throat> that's going to get fitter and fitter and fitter. And once again, you're doing a great job. This is just typical baby stuff where they want to jump around, act a little fractious. She's just expressing herself. But in time, just like we want with a young person, a child themselves, we want them to learn to take all that energy and begin to focus that energy and become a, you know, uh, an upstanding human being, if you will, that can contain themselves. If we let our kids just run around like lunatics as children and bounce off the walls, well, what do you think is going to happen when they start going to school? I mean, this is where, why we get these uh, children that have so many, um, many kids who have... Um, behavioral problems. Well, most of those behavioral problems were probably caused by their parents. So you could say the same thing here. You know, education starts, you know, as soon as anyone interacts with it, with either a child or a horse, you know, so we have to be aware of that. You know, are they training us or are we training them? It always comes back to that. But I think you're doing a very good job of training this horse. I'm not seeing anything I'm not liking here. You're handling this very well. And she's getting to a very good place. In other words, when she's where she should be, you're not doing anything at all and letting her just stay there. When she does, you're doing just enough to stop it. And that's exactly what you want to do. So in other words, we reward good behavior and kind of ignore the rest, if you will. In other words, we don't beat them up. We don't, you know, get aggressive with them, this kind of thing. In other words, when they're right, we do nothing at all. And that's how they know they're doing the right thing. So they know how they're supposed to act in our presence, if you will. That's why it's so wrong to run horses around. Someone just asked me that today, that someone told them, oh, they should be, they should be free lunging their horse over jumps yet. And, you know, you can see how, you know, you have no idea what's going to happen when you do that. Run, I mean, just to run a horse around in a ring doesn't get you anywhere. And I've never seen any good trainer ever do that. Not to mention, you know, if you're running them around over poles and jumps, the damage that can happen. For instance, if, you know, if you're running a horse around and it's supposed to go over these jumps, well, suppose it's going too fast or it lands in the middle of one of them. You know, I can't tell you, I've seen many, many horses with broken coffin bones and at the worst, and in many cases, just bent, you know, uh, twisted ankles and things like that that takes, week, that takes weeks to heal because you don't want the horse stepping on these poles. So once again, if your horse isn't over its back, you shouldn't be going over poles. If it's not over its back, you shouldn't be going up and down hills. Many people will tell you, oh, you go up and down hills to build up the back end. Well, that's true if the horse is over its back. If it's not, you're going to lame up the front end going up and down those hills because the horse will put too much pressure on its front legs because it's not staying over its back. So if you just you know, add that as the caveat to everything that you do in training horses, you won't go wrong. So this has been really good work. As I said, the next thing I would do is begin to add some side reins to this. But I think the source is perfectly mature enough to do the level of work that you're doing here. And of course, hopefully, uh, well, as you said, when you started this work, you know, you're in a big arena, she was dragging you all over the place. Now she's not. So you've, you've come a long, long way. 
So we want, let's say, you know, we start a baby, we want the very first time we work them to maybe be, because they're going to want to leap around like you see this one. And that's where they can hurt themselves. Just one of those leaps up in the air and they come down with, a, with an ankle twisted and you've got a problem on your hand. So that's why we don't want them doing that. And of course, we don't want them to think they can do that when we're on them. Because remember, we are building big waves. And if, the, if we don't teach horses to be calm at the same time, you know, a big wave can kill you. So it's very true of horses. You know, that's why we can't train horses to have these big waves and be in tension because if they do leap up in the air, it can send you to the moon, as I might say, unless you are a very advanced rider. And even those people end up on the ground. So it's very important that we will teach the horse to work calmly from the very beginning. So this is Will Faber from Arch Ride. That was a great job by Victoria with her horse, Caitlin. Uh, they're in Belarus, and I really look forward to uh, seeing them. And I think, uh, Victoria, I'm hoping that down the road you'll think about uh, joining our associate trainer program because I think you're a good candidate for that. So I look forward to seeing you in Russia this year. Keep up the great work. Add some side range to this, and uh, you're well on your way.